Hey everyone, welcome to the GeoTrek podcast. A very special guest today. You're gonna really enjoy this episode, especially if you live in coastal areas that face coastal hazards, but also inland. Hank Hoddy has a lot of experience working in many sectors with sustainability and resiliency. He's a sustainability and resiliency coordinator for Pinellas County, Florida. That's in the Tampa metro area. It includes St. Petersburg and Clearwater. Hank, thanks so much for coming on the GeoTrek podcast. Of course, I'm happy to be here, Hal. Hank, you stand out to me as someone that has really, you know, a lot of experience working with disasters and sustainability, resiliency. How did you become interested in these topics? I mean, is this something you can trace back to your childhood? Did you go through major storms or, you know, when you look back, how did your interest in these topics begin? Yeah, so I, it's it's all of that, but I had one specific moment that really, I think, solidified and catalyzed my actions to do it professionally. I grew up on the East Coast of Florida and surfing and fishing and um, was lucky enough to be included in like some environmental studies and field work going back to elementary school. Um, we grew up recycling. We were, I mean, we cared about the environment and tried to keep our, our place clean and have a high quality of life. And I, I was just a part of it. Like I was just growing up. I didn't know what was necessarily what efforts and initiatives were happening and um, the, I guess, commitment that it took from citizens to really have a special place. Um, so I grew up in that environment. I, I learned some things in undergraduate school um, about sustainability. Um, didn't know I was going to go into that field. And then um, after school, I spent two months in Costa Rica. And um, just to, you know, um, do something after school and uh, just to visit somewhere and I noticed how the citizens there were living off the land. And I'll never forget that the farmers, ranchers out there would grow trees and uh, for their fence line. And once that tree got into a certain caliper uh, or diameter, they would cut it off at a, an appropriate height and then put in the wires. There's no Lowe's, there's no Home Depot, there's no lumber store. You know, there, there wasn't a plethora of fence installation companies. I mean, they literally grew a tree, which is probably stronger than a fence post with concrete. Right. It has roots right in there in the soil, right? Yeah. You know, and that takes years and time and you have to, you know, you have to be patient and, and work with the nature. I'm like, all right, this is special. Um, and then um, um, the recession hit, the great recession and, um, Hurricane Ike also hit, and I had a friend in, in, in Houston, Clear Lake, um, Texas, and um, he said, hey, there's a lot of work out here, um, you know, unfortunately, because, you know, that big storm hit and, and you know, devastated that coast, coastline, and I got into insurance restoration, contracting and construction, and that's when I got insight to you know, post-disaster damage assessments to insurance, to the flow of money from the federal um, state, you know, look, and then locals and then the role of private with insurance and banks and then the impacts to homeowners and, and kind of uh, their, um, I guess, misguidedness and unfamiliarity with the process um, and navigating it and the emotions. And so that took me into graduate school to really study all of that in, in a finer detail. Um, and, um, you know, I've been doing my thesis on FEMA's post-disaster damage assessment process. And then uh, I went and worked for NOAA after that, fortunately, in Washington, D.C., and that brought me back down to the Gulf. And so I got more of the 50,000-foot view at, at, for coastal zone management and resilience. And uh, now I'm here. Yeah, that's amazing. So it sounds like maybe post-Ike, when you were in Clear Lake, Texas, that was like a lot of seemed like you had this interest in sustainability and understanding environments and ecosystems, but then maybe post Ike, you're starting to get into more disaster work there. And then it sounds like that continued with FEMA, right? Yeah, that, that was the shock and awe moment. And um, that's when I realized um, really the impacts to communities for such a devastating storm. Growing up, my, uh, my dad was a contractor and worked Hurricane Andrew and I saw videos that he would bring back of like leaves and printed in drywall. I'm like, you know, I'm just a kid. I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. You know, but I didn't, you know, realize how humans were impacted. And, but then I saw it firsthand for, for two years after Ike. And, you know, then I made that decision to um, go that professional route. 
Yeah, that's amazing. And also, I think you're from near Stewart, Florida, right? Near Jupiter, is that right? So you guys got some big impacts as well, 2004, right? From Hurricanes Francis and Gene. I mean, did that affect your family at all? Or did that feel different to you personally because it was hitting in your backyard? Yeah, that's that's accurate. So we got two storms within two weeks and the eyes were within two miles of each other. Um, and, um, me and, and, and my friends were, we were going, we we're in undergraduate school at Florida state. And I'm glad you brought this up. You know, um, uh, we, we drove home, uh, you know, we, we loaded up everything that we could in Northern Florida, knowing that supplies would be low, um, in that region. And, you know, we got water and, you know, things of gas and, a chainsaw and food and, and, and supplies. I mean, we just knew naturally what to load up on because we grew up in that lifestyle um, in Florida. And uh, we drove down there and we went and helped uh, we, you know, as much as we could and as long as we could without missing class. And we go back up to Tallahassee, then it hits again. And uh, we saw our friends and, and family members, um, you know, get their blue tarps ripped off from another storm or more extensive water damage. And we couldn't do anything about it really. Cause we had to go back to school. We couldn't stay, you know, and um, that was a, an emotional uh, moment as well, but it was an opportunity to, you know, get into action and try to do what we could. Yeah, that's it's hard to see people suffering, especially loved ones or your community when you're at a distance and there's nothing you could do or you feel powerless. But, you know, props to you for loading up as a college student and driving home full of supplies. I mean, that's exactly I I would imagine in that moment, you, you there's almost nothing else you can do. You're, you're like, I have to go and help. Right. I, I know you have a big heart to serve others. And I, I could totally see you going back saying, hey, I have three or four days. Let's let's do what we can kind of thing. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, and, and I, I, I did it, you know, with a group of friends who we all grew up together and we're like, we, we all need to, you know, go home collectively and do this. And um, yeah, it was just a moment of opportunity and, you know, everything that was happening in our space, we just dropped because, you know, we knew that there was a bigger need somewhere else. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And there's something about actually getting on the ground, you know, you begin to see practically what, what people need. And that relates a little bit into the position you're working in right now. I mean, could you explain a little bit as far as your position as sustainability and resiliency coordinator for Pinellas County, a very populated county? I mean, how do these lessons that you've learned in the past, how does that relate to your current job? Maybe you can explain some of the projects you're working on and, and your perspectives on that. Yeah, so um, you know, I'll start with the fact that the the new government role of having a chief resilience officer has really um, become a little more popular in, in the past I don't know six to eight years, and it started with the 100 Rockefeller or the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient City Initiative to fund chief resilience officers and um, in different you know more large scale governments and municipalities. And so I think that caught interest within the government space. And, you know, there's all these little individual pots happening in local government that are tied to the topics, but, you know, those um, efforts aren't, you know, moving forward in a collaborative space or an organized framework. And so that was identified in Pinellas County. We were doing a lot of great things, but perhaps there should be, you know, someone who has a better handle on what's happening in different departments, who can help organize it, who can, you know, provide a framework moving forward. So I saw this opportunity and, and um, I, I applied and was fortunate to get it. And uh, it, it was the first of position for this work. So um, now that I'm in here, um, I work in, in the county, county administrator's office, which is like a mayoral office, um, work under the county commission. And um, I have viewpoint across all the departments. Um, it's not a, you know, a, you know, a role of authority, but a role of, of collaboration and, and making um, linkages and synergies and connecting efforts and, you know, people and uh, being a partner, being a custodian of work. And um, so th that's the, the general gist of my position. But right now, uh, my, my biggest priority is to create a sustainability and resiliency action plan for the county that will kind of catalyze our efforts and momentums moving forward and have uh, more um, institutional type drivers to keep us 
organized and on point and instill new best practices, either, you know, um, it could be a project or it could be a performance measure uh, or, you know, an expenditure of, you know, our budget. And um, I'm uh, seven weeks out from having that plan completed. Uh, it's, it's been a two year effort and um, um, we're gonna, then we're going to get into implementation. And so we're going to do this stuff internally as an organization uh, with the, um, um, you know, with the knowledge that we're going to hopefully have a positive impact on the community as well. Yeah, Hank, that's amazing. Those types of comprehensive plans, or in this case, a sustainability resiliency action plan, those are really extensive. You have to bring together people from all these different backgrounds. That's a huge undertaking. That's really encouraging that that you're so far along. It seems like you, the finish line is in sight. What what proportion of that is related to just you know ongoing month in month out? issues of sustainability and resiliency and then what proportion of that relates to like if there was a natural disaster yeah so um moving into this uh, we we had a baseline assessment of, or an inventory of our of our activities and it could have been a policy or a project or you know a program and so that really set up um the framework of the plan um and, and priorities based on what we were already doing um and what we did was, you know, add things on top of it so we can build upon momentum of existing best practices. And what we added uh, were things that, you know, we saw within the industry itself or what other local municipalities are doing um, so that we can have some type of coordinated work um, as a region. And um, so that, that, that was our you know, take on the portfolio, uh, what I could say in that, you know, my elevator speech on that. But what we also did was we surveyed um, the community and um, we distributed a countywide um, survey, even though we're just on, a, you know, so manage unincorporated Pinellas, um, you know, but we're seen as a leader in, in this space. We got 1300 voluntary responses. And that really told us what people think about climate change disasters. Are we prepared? Are we not? Do they know what we're doing? Do they not know what we're doing? Hank, with your extensive experience working with all these different organizations over the years, could you give, give us an example of when people were very resilient and had the foresight to prepare? It could be individuals, an organization, a community, You know, possibly an example of really great resiliency, and then maybe an example where People were not prepared and got blindsided. Could you possibly share maybe one example of each? Yeah, I'll start with the latter. So I think um, um, Hurricane Michael, you know, um, hitting the Florida Panhandle, Mexico Beach, Panama City. Um, I think that was a blindsiding moment um, because that they ha hadn't been impacted to that an event like that forever. I don't know. I, well, I don't know the history, <laughs> or you do, but um, I, the other thing too, it wasn't just a hurricane, but it escalated in 72 hours to a, a four, almost a five. And, um, you know, on top of my experience that I provided before, I also, um, in my previous job, um, moonlighted as a, an insurance adjuster. So I, I got my license for that and I was spending my weekends. I lived in Mobile, Alabama, driving over there to, to do insurance claims. Um, it, there's, and there's two sides of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm like still trying to pay off my student loans and things like that, but, you know, I was helping people on the ground and, and I got to see that mo those moments of emotion and, and, um, and, and just, um, confusion, uh, like what I saw with hurricane Ike. Um, so I, I don't want to say they're not resilient. I think they were blindsided and, and, you know, the people who were there rallied, you know, they stayed. They didn't move away. They grew up there. They're like, all right, we're going to be hurricane strong, right? Or Mexico beach strong. Um, so th they're rallying. I, I think some of the most resilient people in the space that I see live in tropical islands, 100%. You know, Bermuda, Bahamas, um, um, uh, the Caribbean. I mean, they get walloped all the time. And we may not see the stories, but you know, like on the news, but they just, they get up and rebuild. And I, and we've come to learn from them that like, for instance, concrete works, you know, concrete blocks 
work for, for a home, you know, and it, you need to have, um, uh, it needs to be made of material that um, can be, you know, water resistant, for instance, so you can get back right, you know, you mop it up, get right back in and, and you got a roof. Hank, I've heard this again and again about the Caribbean, like Hurricane Dorian just parked over the Bahamas at a cap five. People I know that went in afterwards, they said, you cannot believe how well they actually did considering what happened. You know, just again, building out of concrete, building resiliently. I mean, it, it seems to be, this is a common theme I've heard and I'm glad that you brought this up. I mean, what do you think we can learn from these Caribbean islands that bounce back unbelievably quickly? I think the simplicity of their building stock is, is one thing. Um, and, you know, they, they have their moments of peril and, and grief. I mean, we're, you know, they, there's a lot of loss of life out there. There's loss of communities. I mean, with Dorian and the Abaco Islands, I mean, they, they didn't have a grocery store. I mean, they lost loved ones. Um, but I, I, I think something really to take away when we talk about resiliency, that it's not always infrastructure, it's people and the mental and emotional fortitude that you have to consistently de deal with this um, and have it be part of your life is, is something to learn from for sure. Yeah, and that's true. The Caribbean islands get hit so frequently. There's something to be said about consistently going through trials, right? If, if you're a whatever, a, a football team, and you're just playing, I mean, look at like, you know, in the SEC, like these big football schools, but every week they're playing a top team, right? So they're just, they're pushed to this level compared to maybe other parts of the country where you're, you're like, you don't see that level, you know? So I, I don't know if that's a good example or not, but I, I, I use sports analogies a lot because it's easy, uh, but I also watch sports and, <laughs> and some people don't, but you know, um, if, if we, if we're on that thread, you have a you have a predominant team, right? And they're doing really well. And then you have this losing streak where for years they're floundering, right? You don't see them moving to a new stadium and hope that that's going to fix things. No, they stay there and they, they defend their home field, right? And, and that's what these folks are doing. They're not saying, yeah. oh, you know, we need to get out of these hur this hurricane track. I call it the bowling alley, right? Like they're, they're there. They stay. That's their home. And they've just figured this out over generations, um, how to deal with it, you know, and, and, and they, and that's, I think that's another thing too. It's, it's a generational, um, uh, institutional knowledge, right. And, and you, kids learn from their parents. It's like, yeah. all right, storm hit, the sun's up, let's get to work. It's passed down. I wanted to ask you too about building with concrete, right? So a lot of these places have, as one of their main building resources is sand. And that relates into building with concrete. I live on a barrier island in Texas where a lot of our historic homes are built out of wood, right? And and we, you could almost make an argument that a more plentiful resource here where I live in Galveston is sand and concrete would fit better, uh, let alone be more resilient. Why do you think we see so much wood-based construction along the Gulf Coast or in Florida? Is it just more of a preference thing, a, a history and culture thing? Why do we see that when in some cases it's not as resilient as building out of concrete? I think it's a cost thing. Um, and, you know, it's not like we see a lot, a lot of large scale concrete manufacturing plants all over the U.S. I mean, um, a lot of it is imported. I, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is like historic homes and structures. That's a different type of wood. That's solid natural wood that was harvested from forests that have been there for hundreds of years. It's they're hardy and dense and a larger size, you know, a four by four or four by two used to actually be four inches by four inches, not, you know, cut down, you know, by the saw blade. And, and now we have these fast growing trees and, you know, we grow them to length quickly so we can cut them and get them on a market. It's a weaker wood, you know, and that's why we see, you know, hurricane clips and ties and, you know, some, you know, structural um, additions to the wood, you know, fasteners, you know, the help of strength at, at those weak points, right? But the, I mean, the other thing too, is that wood is, you know, susceptible to mold sure. more easily than concrete. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to insulate it. There's a lot of things that can get wet, you know, concrete, you can, you know, slap on stucco and, you know, when it gets wet, you just kind of dry it off, you know, wood, you know, we've yeah. seen it again and again, you, you know, wood frame structures, you got to muck and gut and open up sure. the walls. So, I mean, there's, 
I don't know. I, I guess that's my take on it. Yeah. So sometimes I hear the old timers say, man, back in the day, like late 1800s, early 1900s, construction was built so much better. It, it sounds like in a sense, there's some truth to that. Well, yeah. I mean, today it's more of an assembly line. Right. Yeah, for and, sure. and, um, and I, I don't think it's any secret that like that old school craftsmanship is kind of been lost. You see it in cabinet, you see it in more of the finer details, cabinetry and, you know, inside furnishings and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, the stick built homes were, yeah. were really good at it, you know, for <laughs> development uh, purposes. Um, but we're also learning and doing research to make that type of home stronger, which, you know, which is a good progression and advancement for our field. Yeah, for sure. That's a really helpful perspective. Hank, when you look at the professional landscape within sustainability and resiliency, what do you see? I mean, do you see organizations from different sectors working together really well? Do you see a lot of people just siloed in their own little group? I mean, how do you see the landscape? I'm curious because you, you have a lot of experience in these different sectors. I'm curious what you see. Yeah, it's a, it's a great field to be in um, because there's tremendous growth opportunities and the more connections we make with other sectors, other professions, you know, uh, the more collectively we're going to work together. You know, it's, you know, interesting when, when I worked for NOAA, um, I became a certified floodplain manager so I could start to work with floodplain managers because they're in their own little association and, you know, professional circle. Right. And I wanted to dip into that and, and work with them. But now, you know, those floodplain manager association meetings, they're asking for folks like me to present there on resiliency. Gotcha. Right. So those silos uh, and, and, and professional barriers and circles are being broken down. There is a lot of collaboration and, um, and, and it's great because those are more um, traditional foundational modes of government and services and resiliency sustainability is new, right? So we have to, you know, appreciate what's there, collaborate so we can all move forward um, um, together. There, there's a lot of nonprofits and associations that are, that are getting into this world. There's a lot of, you know, homegrown organic citizen groups that are starting to learn more about it and want to interact with, you know, with governments on, you know, preserving land, you know, like we're not developing on this huge piece of land because it's a coastal high hazard area and it'll make them more susceptible to storm surge. There, there is traction. And I, you know, I think that there's some economic drivers right now that are really starting to have people wake up like, you know, yeah. like insurance. Hank, how does this look in Pinellas County? Like you mentioned these different types of groups like floodplain managers, different nonprofits. Is there a time where like everyone meets together for a workshop or, or do you have events? I mean, how does this work in your county for people to come to the table and, and talk and listen and share ideas? Yeah, good question. So um, we have um, a regional resilience coalition that is managed and facilitated by our regional planning council. And the impetus for this was what was happening in Southeast Florida with the Southeast um, uh, Regional Climate Compact. And so you saw Miami-Dade, Broward, Monroe County, um, the Keys rally together 12 years ago, 13, to, to get a hold of this stuff. Because um, they were starting to see like tidal impacts then, yep. they had the hurricanes, we're starting to see that stuff now, right? So we're like a there's some lag time, which is fortunate for us that we can learn from them. So these regional coalitions have really started to blossom and it brings together the different professionals, either through, you know, um, more regularly um, consistent, like work group meetings. We pull in consultants, we, you know, pull in uh, private sector um, professionals to get their insight. Um, and then we do have annual meetings where we all come together. And, and, and in those annual meetings, we include elected officials. Yeah, you know, I'm a big fan of these regional coalition meetings because you're bringing in enough people with professional diversity, some geographic diversity that you're seeing a wide range of issues. But then it's it's not on this national level either where you go to one of these mega conferences and you get lost in it. It it seems like it's it's at a scale that you can meet a couple times a year and have discussions and move things along. Yeah, and we're only good as, as we are working to le collectively. So we know that water doesn't care about boundaries and yeah, jurisdictions, right. zones, ordinances. So, you know, we're trying to, you know, amend or 
alter what we do so that um, in, in all of this, in all that space, so that you know everyone benefits. You know, not just one particular jurisdiction or you know, city. Hank, earlier in this podcast, we talked about the back-to-back hurricanes in 2004, Hurricanes Francis and Jean in in Southeast Florida. And 2004 wasn't even done yet. Ivan hit the panhandle as a Cat 3. You had Charlie south of you as a Cat 4. 2004 is a terrible year. 05 also had a bunch of impacts with with Rita down in the Keys, Wilma south of you, Katrina coming across the state. I mean, and then we talked about Michael, 2018, to the west of you in the panhandle. When you start looking at these tracks on the map, you start to say, wow, Pinellas County and Tampa metro area, Tampa St. Pete metro area has been very lucky. It's been what over really 100 years since you've been struck. Yeah. I mean, how does that affect the local psychology? I mean, you see a lot of bad things happening in the state, but then in your smaller region there, you've been very lucky. How, how does that affect people's perception of hurricane risk? Do they, do they say, hey, a lot of bad stuff's happening in the state. It's going to come to us. Or do people kind of take this viewpoint? Hey, uh, we're just, we're never going to get hit. They always miss us. Yeah. What's that saying? It only takes one, one big one. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, and the interesting thing about all those hits that you mentioned is that Floridians fade. They rallied. They're like, all right, you know, this is the natural course of things. It's where we live. Um, and um, we, but it, in recent years, um, we did have Irma um, that, you know, went up to the middle of the state and, and impacted us. Um, Hurricane Ada. Uh, well, it was a hurricane for like a few hours overnight, or something like that. It skirted the, the coast, but it brought in storm surge. And, um, but that was a; those were more localized impacts and not an entire community. And but we, I mean, we did see people who had to um, leave their homes. You know, substantial damage. Sure. Um, yeah, we got three to five feet of storm surge from Ada, and um, you know, we didn't get a federal disaster declaration, so we didn't get FEMA money. We didn't even get personnel. The state didn't respond. It was just us. And it's like, wow, this is a moment of resiliency. I, but the, the f- fact that you make about us not having the major hit also makes us the most vulnerable. And when you look at, you know, U.S. national global economic studies from reinsurers and other, you know, major modelers, you know, climate outfits, think tanks, you know, we're, we're one of the most vulnerable because there's just so much dense population uh, because, you know, in, in some respect, hurricanes provide a natural balance of things. Um, and yeah, so I, it, it's tough because um, people are cognizant, but since they haven't gone through it, um, it's a little bit harder to get the message across. Um, but those little outfits and communities that have got impacted recently, um, we're, we're trying to leverage that to tell a good you know, story of impact and, and recovery yeah. and what it likes moving forward. Um, but I, you know, we're, I think, I think um, the private sector impact is also starting to get to people and they're starting to realize like, oh, something is awry. So something's weird here because I can't find insurance. Yeah, we're seeing that really, it, the insurance availability or even rates. I hear people saying, oh my gosh, my insurance rate just doubled in the last several years or something crazy like that. It's hitting people. It's not just doubling. You have insurers vacating the geography. They're That's like, right. we're, not even, we're not even writing there anymore. Yeah. And I, that needs to be told a little bit more. It's like our risk is too high. Yeah, you know, they're pulling for, out. For their book of business. Yeah, they're just completely pulling out of whole areas, right? They're like, oh, we don't write there anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, my, it's really hard to state as like a goal and a mission, but I, I, I want to mitigate so well and be so resilient that we get insurers to come back to this market. I love that. So maybe you say, hey, our climatology hasn't changed, but our, our building codes have changed. Our, our, uh, we've done all these things to really mitigate against this loss. So come on back in. We've lowered our risk. Yep. 
Yeah, I love that. Hank, I, before I forget, I wanted to ask you too, you mentioned a few smaller storms like Ada, some of these storms people haven't heard about. And so, you know, for the big Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Katrina, here comes state money, federal money, grants, all this stuff. But for some of these smaller storms you mentioned, you kind of had to rely on yourselves to recover through that. Can you share like what does Pinellas do to kind of help themselves move forward on some of these projects? You know, we hear about grants, we hear about federal programs. What about just what you're doing locally to kind of help yourselves there on the ground? Yeah, I'll tell an interesting story about what we had to do after Ada. Um, when, when you get these major storms, I mean, before it even hits landfall, you get a presidential declaration and you got, you know, all the trucks, you know, private sector, public, you know, going down the highways, right? We've seen that. There was nothing. It was crickets. Um, and I mean, we didn't even get volunteers, right? They weren't mobilized. And the state was like, well, there's no federal de declaration, so we're not going to yep. activate you know, our people. And uh, of course we brought them down here. We're like, no, people are, had to leave their homes. You know, they got either two inches or 18 inches water or more. We had the damage assessment data and we had to be really, really calculated with that um, and, and verify um, the, the impacts, the depth and have photos. We barely eked out a declaration with the small business administration so that people could get loans. And, you wow. know, some of these, yeah, some of these people, they own their homes. They didn't, you know, they weren't required to have insurance. They didn't have it. And, you know, here they are out, out, of, out of their home. You know, they didn't have that policy coverage and in their insurance to, you know, get, um, 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 all, you know, alternate yeah. living expenses. Um, they couldn't cover the loss. And so they had to go get a loan from the SBA to help fill that gap. And it like, barely got that for the community. So this was almost a flood event that just fell through the cracks is what you're saying. Not their cracks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, no, but like it could have been like, it's, it's, it's big enough that it's flooding homes, but not big enough to really get on the radar for different types of assistance. And grants. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So the assistance had to come from us, you know, so it was a localized event and in the future. So I, and, and what happened is three to five feet of storm surge was pushed up at high tide um, overnight. And, and, um, you know, there, there were rescues, uh, there was everything, right. But like, it didn't make national news. So the, and what we're worried about and what I'm worried about really is this is, I, I think, a an indicator for the future with, uh, tidal flooding. Yeah. And, um, I'm really concerned about that because there, there's going to be, you know, the hurricanes, uh, you know, acute and major, but the tidal flooding is going to be chronic, persistent, going to wear away at infrastructure. You're going to have, and, and there's no like tidal flooding coverage, so to speak. Some of the, some of the insurance um, is based off, you know, a, a named storm, for instance, sure, sure. title title's not named. You can't go get insurance for the October King flood, <laughs> you know, a King tide. Um, and what, and what we saw with Ada, um, with our vulnerability assessment work, modeling um, sea level rise projections is that storm surge that took place is what we may see consistently throughout the year in, in 2070. Yeah. And, you know, these minor events happen so frequently. And then, you know, it's like these minor events happen frequently, but now they're they're coming up to the level of what used to be a more moderate flood, three to five feet. So all of a sudden that's, you know, just a foot or two of sea level rise. All of a sudden you're getting your four and five foot storm surges, what what used to be maybe two feet. And so all of a sudden that's inundating buildings. And that, that kind of thing can happen, like you said, without a big name storm. It just, you get a strong onshore wind, or maybe you're on the fringe of a bigger storm that hits Apalachicola or something like that. And suddenly you have 80 houses that are flooded or something like that could happen. Then you talk about these huge precipitation events at, you know, in a yeah. highly developed dense area and it's high tide. There's nowhere for the water to go. Yeah. So it just bowls up and, you know, people flood that way. It's yeah. so I, um, but it, it was a huge lesson learned for us. And, um, you know, we're trying to alter, you know, our, approach for not just, you know, resilient infrastructure and education, but also emergency management. Mm. Yeah. And probably response to these, like you said, it can be a heavy downpour with a high tide and all of a sudden you have a lot of flooding. And again, it's, it's maybe not really hitting the larger national media at all. Like people, you talk to family in other States, they would be like, what are you talking about? We didn't know there was a flood. And all of a sudden you're like, no, we we're underwater. 
Yeah. You know, I, I talked about, you asked about my position and what I see and, you know, I talked about it being a growth opportunity, you know, and that, that's like, I know a lot about this locally because not as the resilience coordinator, but I got tapped to be our emergency operations center recovery director. And so, you know, I oversee um, and report out on damage assessments and our whole community approach and, you know, how our, you know, how does our preparedness and response efforts lead into long-term recovery if we have to go that route? And so um, the, you know, there's going to, I'm hopeful that there's going to be an evolution of emergency management with that resiliency lens, because we're, we may see a lot of events that aren't going to get a declaration and we have to take care of it locally. There's no one else. That's, that's a really good point. And with rising seas, right? Like, again, this two or three foot storm surge, all of a sudden, it's, it's higher than it used to be. It's flooding things, but that's not hitting Washington, D.C. at all. You're maybe not getting a larger declaration. So what, what you're saying is this may fall on the local municipalities to take care of themselves. There may not be outside assistance that arrives, especially for these, these smaller and middle size events. Yeah, what I'm really saying is it already is. Right. You're saying like you're already seeing this. Yeah, well, we just did. You yeah. know, there's a um, after Irma, there's a um, some neighborhoods in the in the Keys that had uh, permanent tidal inundation for 90 days. Wow. Yeah, and and you know you've got areas in Miami that makes the news: tidal flooding, rain event. You know, now we're seeing this in other parts of the country. DC, I think, just got some last night. You know, and yeah. so and so, um, yeah, and and again, there's an impact to people. The state and feds aren't coming in. And so I, I think a component of resiliency is also not relying on them as much to have sure. a declaration and, you know, all the people to, to swoop in and the funds, you know, um, I mean, that's the whole impetus for, um, for you know, mitigation and, and adaptation beforehand. And, and luckily we have, man, a lot of money coming our way to do that stuff and we need to grab that opportunity, but it takes foresight and, and, and know how in the moment to take advantage of that stuff. For sure. And that leads into another question I wanted to ask you, Hank, as far as like resources, like what are some resources people can find if, if people may be listening to this podcast in a coastal community or they may be in Iowa, they're listening, they're saying, hey, I want to make my community more resilient. I mean, can you direct them to any like online resources, any any websites, podcasts, videos, I mean, anything that you could recommend to for people to take the next action step and you know, move towards making themselves more resilient in their community as well. Yeah, there's a lot of resources. I try to be resource agnostic. I, I think something that I I really hone in on is get in, in contact and in the loop with your local emergency management office, you know, and get, you know, we have an app called Ready Pinellas. Get the app, get the newsletter, read the website, you know, see what they're putting out. And then, you know, get recommendations for what you can do at home. What, what does home hardening look like? What does a preparedness kit look like? You know, something easy that um, it, I think it's hard for folks to keep, you know, just a box laying around every year for an event. But sure. uh, there's simple adaptations like you can have like a stack of totes um, and uh, or bins, whatever sure, people call sure. them, and you know, write your supplies on the side of it. So when something's coming, you see the list on the side of a bin, and you throw the stuff in it and evacuate, right? Um, and so you know it's a grab. Um, I, I think that's the easiest thing to do. And then you know, you go to your local government, and you go to the commission meetings or city council, or, or you go to the officials and, and ask, be like, hey, what are we doing to safeguard this community? What are we spending? Can we do more? You know, like. Are, are, are we safe? And, you know, I, I'm hoping that, you know, we're planning on, on um, we are altering our approach for our, ca our large scale capital projects. And we're, um, we're looping in adaptation and mitigation principles for future flooding conditions that will um, um, enhance the design and engineering of that capital infrastructure to be more resilient. And I, mean, I, I you know, I, I hope that our residents appreciate our expenditure on that. That's a wise use of tax money in my mind. And I, I, I wanna get to the point where they appreciate that as well and encourage more of it. You know, and once we do that stuff internally within, you know, our institution that 
then we can, you know, even take advantage of all the grants. And so I think just be as local as possible, you know, get in the know um, and, you know, encourage your neighbors, take inventory of what's on your street. Who's got chainsaws, who's got, you know, gas, who's got a, a big freezer full of meat or whatever. And it, I mean, um, resilience and recovery happens first at, at the, at the neighborhood scale. And so, you know, get your unit together, maybe meet in, annually, tap into your HOA, um, work with your government officials, show up at the meetings, volunteer, be a stakeholder for surveys or, or committees. I, I think that's, you know, one of the real first one. And then you start to expand your knowledge and you see, oh, well, this nonprofit out there has a really good guide for home hardening or, you know, resilient construction. I mean, all that stuff is out there. There's very simplified material from SBP's one, Flash, Smart Home America, um, um, Habitat for Humanity. I mean, they're, they're, um, they're faith-based organizations. They're, there's really um, uh, a good momentum in that. And, but once you get that local knowledge and know what the gaps are, then it's easier to figure out what the other resources are um, that simplify things. So. Yeah, Hank, I really love that local focus. I think that really empowers people, right, to to talk to people in their neighborhood, to go to these local meetings, whether it's city council, emergency management, just have these conversations locally. I think that gives people more power than just going to a national website or watching things on YouTube, right? Because it, it's not necessarily like we just need more information. Some of this stuff is like, okay, what do we do with the information we already have and how do we take action items and, and steps to actually help protect ourselves? Yeah, so it, just one more plug is your local government does more for you than any other government. Right. And so you may not know it. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I, I think uh, um, I'm hoping another evolution in, in my world is that resiliency is a service, much like maintaining a road or providing water, you know, or emergency management in a time of disaster. It's all looped together in my mind. And yeah, so you can ask, like, what service are you providing to safeguard our community? Okay. If we don't have that, how do we get it? Yes, I will approve this tax referendum for, you know, one cent to go towards mitigation. You know, um, yes, you should have this extra staff person to go get grants from the federal government. You know, it th just things like that. I mean, I think, you know, buy-in for what the local government, you know, wants to do or but maybe hesitant, you know, because of pushback. I mean, you know, push forward. Yeah, it sounds like in Pinellas too, you're looking locally, you're looking at how you can use funds from local taxation, but then you're also keeping an eye on federal grants. You're kind of doing both because I, I see sometimes people are just thinking 100% about grants. They're not thinking about what they're doing locally. So I really like this perspective that you have both internally and externally. That's a turn that I've taken with my position. You know, we're fortunate. We've had something called Penny for Pinellas. It's a one cent tax referendum on sales. Um, and it's not just local folks, actually more, most of that money comes from uh, our tourism and that one cent that we get, you know, annually, um, um, over a 10 year tax record re referendum vote, um, goes back into the community. And so that's what we use for our infrastructure and our upgrades and our shelters and, you know, affordable housing and economic development. I mean, flood control, erosion, uh, all of it, um, land acquisition and, um, so my take on this now uh, is we need to use that money first, you know, and then leverage yeah. that to get the grants. Um, that's the tactical approach. And yeah, if you're, if you're just relying on grants, you're going to be relying on Congress and federal appropriations and the wise use of that money from, from um, you know, federal government. And, you know, there's, there's great stuff happening there. Don't, don't get me wrong, but we're spending money on the ground every single day. When you said penny for Pinellas, is that a penny on the dollar or is that a penny per purchase? It's a penny uh, per purchase um, on the dollar. So, you know, six, we have 6%, six um, uh, there's 6% sales tax on any purchase. That goes to the state. It's divvied up. We have an extra cent. So we have seven. I understand. So that cent goes back into our coffers to distribute for infrastructure and services throughout our community. Um, and this, these are large scale projects. So um, that money spent every day, you know, on the ground and, and in Pinellas County, even though we get that one, that one cent from people from, from around yeah. the entire country. I mean, we have almost a million residents here, but we have like 14 million visitors. 